While in Europe, I made a day trip to Monaco with the purpose of visiting the Oceanographic Museum here. And sort of like how I looked for lions in the rest of Europe, I was keeping my eyes open here trying to find something in particular. This time, I was looking for a mention of the seagrass Calerpa taxifolia. To understand why, we have to learn a little bit about this museum's history. Built over a hundred years ago, this is where people like Jacques Cousteau, the famous researcher, explorer, and documentary filmmaker, came to work. The goal of this place, like any museum, was for people to come and learn, the desired outcome of which being hopefully creating a desire to help conserve and protect the animals and environment featured and explored here. Now, while all that's good and fair, thousands of miles away in the Indian Ocean, there lived a seagrass, C. taxifolia. Here, in the plant's native range, it's just another member of the community, and is kept in check naturally. But if we look at some of the grass's more notable characteristics, you might be able to see why I bring it up. To start, we can see that it has a high risk of forming a monoculture, or basically, it forms large tarps which cover everything else. It also prefers a high salinity, which makes it adaptable to most ocean environments, and especially seas, where salt concentrations can be much higher than oceanic averages. And it makes it onto several noxious weed lists, indicating that it produces toxic chemicals. Looking further down, we can see that it reproduces asexually, specifically through fragmentation. What this means is that if you try to remove it by cutting it up, each new fragment can grow into a whole new plant. Or in short, it's impossible to remove. To make things better, over recent years it has gained a tolerance to cold waters. I'll explain how that happened in a second, but what this does is expand the grass's potential range into areas which, until recently, it could not survive. Now, I know what you must be thinking, is this aquatic seagrass from the Indian Ocean, Wisconsin adapted? And luckily, no, it's not. But, due to its production of toxins in its leaves, the plant has no serious predators and has no real documented control mechanisms. To compete, Calerpa grows fast, uses resources efficiently, smothers out any competitors, and can outsurvive many species if resources become limited. To make things better, its rate of spread is indicated as high. What all of this results in is a seagrass that can outcompete native seaweeds and seagrasses. And it's for this reason that the seagrass is said to be causing a major ecological event in the Mediterranean, which leads to overall decrease in biodiversity. What this means for the environment is the eventual displacement of the native species. What this means for humans is poor fishing and reduced tourism, or essentially less food and less money for the people living near the coast. Now, all these factors together make a pretty scary plant, which is why even places like the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources are writing about it. But the reason I brought up this little seagrass when talking about the Oceanographic Museum of Monaco is due to its most dangerous quality by far. People like the way it looks. I can't really pretend to understand this, but I guess there's something about the way it looks that make people go, yep, that's a plant. And for that reason, it was brought from the Indian Ocean here to Europe to be used in aquarium displays. Things were fine until 1980, when the Wilhelma Zoo of Stuttgart, Germany, through artificial selection, produced a cold-tolerant strain of this grass. Because warming enormous tubs can cost enormous amounts of money, aquariums tend to keep their waters cooler. And now that sea taxifolia could handle the cold, it became an ideal seagrass for nearly every aquarium exhibit, even ones that didn't involve species from the Indian Ocean. Soon enough, the little cold-tolerant seagrass expanded into many more aquarium displays across Europe, including into the Oceanographic Museum of Monaco. Only four years after this cold-tolerant strain was produced and shared across the continent, a small patch of the seagrass was found growing in the Mediterranean. Or, more specifically, a small patch of this grass was found growing in the waters directly surrounding the Oceanographic Museum of Monaco. Now, the museum claims that this patch growing here was coincidental and a result of ocean currents, but if you'll remember, natural specimens of sea taxifolia aren't adapted to the colder Mediterranean waters, and therefore even if the ocean did bring a wild specimen here, it would not survive. So this patch must have come from a sample of the artificially produced cold tolerant strain found in many museums and aquariums. This combined with the fact that the first time sea taxifolia had ever been recorded growing in the Mediterranean, it was literally right next to the Oceanographic Museum made it clear that this seagrass must have come from within the aquariums of the museum. 
The most popular theory about how this could have happened has to do with the way the plant reproduces. If you'll remember, C. taxifolia reproduces asexually, specifically through fragmentation. And in fact, just a single piece as small as a centimeter is all that's needed to start an entirely new plant. So, all it would take are a couple of scraps washed out of a tank while cleaning it and, well, it's a pretty short trip from here to the ocean. Within three years of this initial patch, C. taxifolia was noted on the French coasts of Cape Martin a couple kilometers away. Four years after this, so 1991, new points of colonization by Livorno, Italy were found, this time 240 kilometers from Monaco. Soon after, there were sightings of the grass off the coast of Agai, Le Levando, Hayeres, Toulon, however you say this one, and St. Cyprian, reaching nearly 370 kilometers from Monaco. By 1992, the Balearic Islands of Spain were noticing patches of the seagrass as well, and this time over 600 kilometers away. Pretty soon, it was being spotted off the coasts of mainland Spain, and even as far as Tunisia and Croatia. In many of these places, it was outcompeting local species and establishing, you guessed it, a monoculture. Now, seagrass beds aren't entirely uncommon in any of these areas. The problem with C. taxifolia seagrass beds, however, was another thing I talked about already. It's toxic. By producing and storing toxins in its leaves, the C. taxifolia remains untouched by most fish, granting itself another competitive advantage against other native seagrasses. Specifically, however, C. taxifolia produces a compound known as calerpinine, which, while it's in the plant's leaves, makes sure nothing eats it. But calerpinine has also been found to leach into surrounding waters, where it's been shown to destroy certain fish eggs and even bring down the productivity of other nearby plants. So, not only does this toxin give the plant the advantage of not being eaten, it also gives the surrounding plants the disadvantage of lowered production. And all of this combined has resulted in reports of destroyed clam beds and fisheries. Obviously, none of this is good, both for native species or for humans trying to eat those native species. And the damage done by this seagrass to both the environment and the humans who depend on it only continues to grow. Which is why I tried to find a mention of it here where it all started. I looked at all of the exhibits, each tank, and every display, and yet I failed. Now, I don't want to put all the blame on this place. In the end, we had no idea how invasive C. taxifolia would end up being. But it does seem a little weird that in a place built around educating people on ocean preservation, not a single mention of C. taxifolia could be found, despite the damage it's doing to the directly adjacent waters, and especially because we know exactly where that cold tolerant strain of C. taxifolia came from in the first place. Now, I don't want to tell a highly respected and prestigious institute like this how to do things, but to understand why the Oceanographic Museum of Monaco has more or less stayed silent on the matter, you need to know that in reality, accidents like this aren't exactly uncommon. Another similar example is what's called the chestnut blight. The blight originally comes from Japan, where the Japanese chestnut trees had developed a degree of immunity. But when the Bronx Zoo in New York City brought over some of these Japanese trees, foresters of the zoo began to notice the American chestnut trees in the park had little to no defenses against the blight carried on the imported trees, and as a result became infected and, well, died. From here, the blight spread rapidly across the east coast of the United States, driving the American chestnut tree into near extinction and killing an estimated 4 billion trees. Sadly, these aren't the only two examples of this happening, but they are possibly the most revealing on the tricky nature of conservation, where even places built to celebrate the natural world can have serious and direct negative impacts on said natural world. From these escape events, we can learn two valuable lessons. First, sometimes even trying to help can be hurtful, because more often than not, the best way to conserve is to leave species where they evolved, even if that means we don't get as many cool things in our zoos and aquariums. And second, each time something like this happens, we get the opportunity to learn and get better at this whole not destroying the natural world thing. In a way, the lessons we've learned from these outbreaks are some of the most expensive information we have ever obtained, considering the environmental damage and literal economic losses that have come afterwards. In the end, while accidental spreading of invasive species is never good, the least we can do is learn the most we can from them when they do happen, and use this information to make sure they don't happen again elsewhere. 
I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, I hope you'd consider going to my Patreon like all of these people going by on screen. It really helps me out and makes trips like this possible. Of course, subscribe if you'd like to see more videos. I think I'm done talking about Europe for a while, so hopefully next week I'll be back with more regular video topics. So stay tuned and thanks for watching.